So this is joint work with Arthur Yesh and Max Lorai. And as the first talk, this is on ground-based compression. So I think I don't need to uh, repeat everything just to fix some of my notation. So the idea is that we uh, want to compress a string, a compressible string by a context-free grammar, which produces only that string. And in this talk, I will often call this um, a straight line program or short SLP. So um, such a grammar has to satisfy two properties, basically. So here's an example of such a grammar. Um, we have these rules and the, the non-terminals, the S0 to S4, I will often call variables. And well, every variable should occur exactly once on the left-hand side of a rule. And then you want to avoid cyclic derivations. So you need to, to define some topological order, which is respected by the, by the rules. So in this talk, I will often view the grammar as a graph, um, a DAG. And so the, the node sets of this DAG are the, the variables, SI, and the terminal symbols. So here are 0 and 1. And well, the, the rules are reflected in the edges. So for example, this, this rule here, S4 to S3, S2, is translated into this edge from S4 to S3 and from S4 to, um, to S2. And then, of course, you can also look at the, the parse tree or the derivation tree of the grammar. The unique tree um, and so here at the leaves you can see the string which is compressed so 10110 and the connection between the DAG and the tree is that the DAG only represents every subtree isomorphism, isomorphism type only once right for example this the subtree here under s2 occurs actually twice in the in the derivation tree but it's only stored once here in the in the DAG okay so in that sense it's a compact representation of the tree so as in the first talk, I will always denote the, the string length by capital N, which can be up to exponential in the grammar size. So for example, by repeated um, concatenation, you can produce strings of length two to the N by only um, N, N rules. And furthermore, I will, well, through most of this parts of this talk, I will assume Chomsky normal form. So this means all rules will have the form A to BC or A just derives a single symbol A. Okay, so straight line programs can represent exponentially long strings. If you um, are interested in more structured data like trees or graphs, there are also um, formalisms for that. And while computing the smallest compression, so the smallest SLP for a given string is an NP-hard problem, there are practical algorithms like, for example, repair, which, which um, yeah, turn to work quite well on, on practical data. So more importantly, um, for this talk is um, the topic of efficient algorithms on SLP compressed strings. So the idea is that we want to design algorithms that work directly on the compressed representation and avoid um, decompression. So um, let me just mention one example here, um, testing equality. So it was proven by many authors uh, over a couple of years that you can test whether two given SLPs uh, compress the same string. Okay, and despite of the fact that the string can be exponentially large, this can be done in polynomial time. Okay, and so in, in many of these algorithmic applications, there are basically two important parameters. One is, of course, size. We want to have small compressions of, of our string. And the other one is, is the height, or sometimes it's also called depth. I will use height and depth um, interchangeably in this talk. So by height, I mean the height of the unique derivation tree of the SLP. And so why is this important? Well, it, this can be seen uh, with the random access problem. So the problem is given an SLP for a string of length n and some position i, and the, the task is just to output the symbol at that position. There is a very simple solution which goes as follows. So in, in pre-processing time, we first compute the length of every variable. So the length of the string derived by every variable. And this can be just done in a bottom-up fashion Well, we, we start at the the terminal rules, they all have uh, length one. And then if we know the, the length of B and C, then the length of A is just the, the sum of B and C. So this is just linear time pre-processing. And then if you want to query, let's say position I in some variable A, then we look at the rule A to B, C, and then we can compare I with the length of B so that we can decide whether we should um, continue in B or in C. So either we continue at position I in B or we continue in C at position I shifted by the length of B. Okay, so basically what, what happens here in query time is that we compute a path from the, from the root of the derivation tree to some leaf, uh, which is the desired symbol. So the query time is, is obviously linear in, in the height of the SLP. 
So pre-processing time and space is just linear. We just have to store the grammar and um, all of these lengths of, of the variable. So this is just linear space. So now there's a natural question, well, how large can this height be? So in worst case, this can be as large as the grammar itself. And um, so there's the natural question, can we somehow re restructure the, the grammar, the, the SLP, so that this height is somehow small? And indeed, such, a, such results were known. So um, in 2002, both um, Wojciech Ritter and also a second paper by, by Charikar and co-authors uh, proved some kind of um, depth reduction. So what they showed is that you can always reduce the, the height of an SLP to be only O of log n, but the size uh, becomes a bit larger. So it grows from G to uh, G times log n. So what this gives is a very simple solution for the random access problem, which runs in space G times log n and this, the query time, the access time is uh, log n, okay? Um, this is however not optimal. So there is a very nice paper by, by Philip Bille and, and co-authors where they actually show that this can be done in linear space. So this, this log n factor can actually be, uh, be removed. So um, just to remark um, the, the main technical tool, what they show is um, a data structure which solves the um, weighted ancestor problem. So if you know this, this is some kind of um, variant of the predecessor problem, but, but on trees, okay? And um, so in the area of grammar-based compression, it has been an open problem in the field um, whether this logarithmic blow-up can actually be avoided here. So can we maybe somehow reduce this um, or remove this, this logarithmic factor? Because this would then immediately yield a very simple um, solution uh, for the random access problem in linear space and logarithmic time. And indeed, uh, we can answer this uh, question in the positive. So two years ago, uh, we showed at Fox that you can always um, reduce in linear time the height of your SLP to order of log n, while the size only grows by a constant factor. Okay, and also this is constant factor is is not uh, gigantic. I think it's something like twelve or so. So maybe it's a, it's a pra practical yet, but maybe it can be um, improved with um, yeah with some more work. Okay, so this um, in particular gives us a very simple solution for random access in log n time and linear space. And furthermore, um, it has many algorithmic applications. So basically, there are many um, problems where there's some dependency on the height of the grammar. And this can now always be replaced by, by log n. So here are a couple of examples, rank and select queries, computing fingerprints, range minimum queries, subsequence matching. It was also used recently in, in, by the database community. So there's a paper by, by Schmidt and Schweikart where they used it in the context of spanner evaluation. So in many of these problems, you have some kind of dependency on the height of the grammar. And now this can always be replaced by log n um, while maintaining the, the linear size here. And even in, in some cases, we even uh, get um, improved bounds. Let me also mention um, a recent result together with uh, Pavel Gorbachevsky, where we used this, this balancing technique to obtain a linear time algorithm for compressed pattern matching. So here the problem is you're given a text compressed by an SLP and an uncompressed pattern, and you want to test whether the pattern occurs in the text. Okay, and this can now uh, be solved in, in linear time. So this appeared at, at Zoda this year. Okay, so um, for the next few minutes, I want to uh, give you a proof sketch of, of this balancing result. And um, so it basically has, has two parts. So the first part is some kind of path decomposition. So we, as I said, we view our SLP as a DAG, and then we decompose it into um, a disjoint union of, of paths. And this, this decomposition will also have a logarithmic height. And then the second tool is something that we call weighted prefix sum, and I will um, comment on that later. So let's first start with, with this path decomposition. So before we decompose um, DAGs, let's start with tree for trees first. I think this is something that many of you already know. So you can apply techniques like heavy path decomposition, uh, we use something very similar called sentry decomposition. So what you do is you're given a tree and you label each node by its leaf size. So the number of leaves which are descendant and take the logarithm. So then you get this, this labeling. And um, well, these numbers are mon monotonically decreasing if you go down a tree and uh, down a path in the, in the tree, okay? And now what you can do is uh, observe the following. So suppose you have a node which is labeled by some number and it has a child which has the same number then all other children must have a strictly decreasing number. 
Okay, so this is an easy property of this of this centroid uh, labeling. So what you now can do is you can introduce these centroid edges, which connect nodes with the same label. So this means that every node has at most one outgoing centroid edge. So in particular, you have now partitioned your tree into centroid paths. Um, like for example, this is a centroid path, and here's one. There are also trivial ones like like here and here. They are paths of length zero, but we also consider them as, as centroid paths. And since all um, numbers are bounded by log n, uh, we can observe that every root to leave path traverses at most log n many centroid paths. Okay. So in the situation of trees, this is uh, very simple, and this was already known before. So, but what, what about DAGs? For example, the DAG of an SLP. So we could try to do the same technique. So we label each node by by its size somehow. So what is the size? Well, later, um, each node represents a variable in the SLP. So the size should be um, the length of the of the string defined by the um, by the variable, which can be computed as the number of outgoing paths. Right. So you count the number of paths from a node to some to some sink where the um, terminal symbols are, and then we again take the logarithm. So then we get such a labeling, which is again monotonically decreasing if you go down. And uh, you still have the property that if you connect um, nodes which have the same labeling, then every node has at most one outgoing edge. But now, because we're in a DAG, not in a tree, you might have multiple incoming um, centroid edges. Okay. So what you actually get is a partition into trees, not um, paths. So these are these in trees which, which point to the roots which are um, at the bottom of the DAG. Okay, so but actually we would like to have paths to make to make our life simpler. So what do we do is a simple trick. We actually consider two numbers. So here's a definition for every node v in the deck. We define the out number as the number of paths from v to some sink, and the in number, which is the number of paths from a source to v. So for example, from the starting variable in SLP. And then we will noble, uh, label each node by a pair of numbers, namely the logarithm of the out number and the logarithm of the in number. Okay, and then you get this kind of labeling. So if you look at the first component, then this is monotonically decreasing, and the second component is monotonically increasing. Okay, and then if you do the analysis and you connect again nodes with which have the same labels, so the first and the second component should be the same, then indeed you get um, well, for every node at most one outgoing edge and at most one incoming edge. So now you, you get a disjoint union of centroid paths. And well, this decomposition has only logarithmic height. Well, because well, the first number can only decrease log n times, and the, the second number can only increase log n times. Okay, so um, it's two times log n. Okay, so what we have done now is we, we, we take our SLP, we view it as a DAG, and decompose it in this fashion. Uh, and well, we know now that every path traverses at most order of log n many centric paths, where n is here the, the total string length. And now the remaining goal is to somehow make these centroid paths short. I mean, for example, if they would already have constant length, then we would be immediately done, right? But they could still be very long, possibly as long as the grammar itself, okay? And so this is the second part. So let's zoom in onto such a single centroid path, okay? And the idea is that we want to accelerate the derivation on the centroid path. So what we will do is we look at the variables which branch off to the left, so I call them L1, L2, L3, up to Ln, and uh, the variables which branch off to the right, R1, R2, up to Rn. And remember that every one of these uh, variables, again, lie on some, on some centric path, maybe something like this. Okay, and the idea is the following. It's a very simple idea. We can redefine every variable as a concatenation of, of this red part and this blue part. Okay, so this, this variable here, can be written as uh, the concatenation of this uh, red part, which is um, L3, L4, up to Ln. So this red part is actually a suffix of this entire L string, starting in L1, L2, right? Together with this prefix, so R1, R2, up to some, I don't know, Rj. And this blue part is a prefix of this entire string R1 to Rn, okay? So the idea is the following. Let's take this entire L string and try to, using new rules, try to define every uh, suffix of this L string. So for every suffix, we have a variable which defines that, suff uh, that suffix, okay? And then we can just um, yeah, put everything together. So for every 
variable on the centroid path, we decompose it into this red part and the blue part. And then we have some additional rules which define these, these suffixes and prefixes. Okay, so for now, let's just focus on the prefix, uh, on the suffixes because, I mean, the situation is just symmetric. So the remaining task is to construct um, suffix SLPs for the string L1 to LN. Of course, it should have a linear size, so linear in here in, in N, the number of these variables. And it should somehow have a small depth so that we can get the, the, the logarithmic height. So we will actually not get um, like a concrete bound on the on the height of the SLP, but rather we will do some kind of amortized analysis for this. Okay, so more, to be more precise, we will show the following lemma. So given the string L1 to LN, so these are the variables which branch off to the left, uh, we will view them now as a weighted string in the following way. So these LIs are actually variables in the SLP, but for now we will view them as single letters. And each letter has a weight associated with it, namely, the length of the string derived by that, right? So for example, L3, it derives some, some string and the string length is the weight of, of the single letter L, L3, okay? And then what we can show is that we can compute an SLP which generates all suffixes. So it has variables S1 to Sn and the ith suffix variable produces the, the ith suffix. So Si produces um, L1, uh, Li up to Ln. It only has linear size. And furthermore, we can give some kind of bound on the, on the lengths of, of the paths. So the distance between the suffix variable li to some symbol lj, so the distance is the, the length of the path in the derivation tree, is bounded by, by this term here. So this is order of one plus the logarithm of the weight of the suffix si minus the logarithm of the weight of lj. So intuitively, what, what this bound says is that if um, the symbol lj is very heavy, in, in comparison to SI, then the path should be very short. On the other hand, if LJ is very light, then the path can be very long. Okay, and so in that sense, we can get some kind of amortized um, analysis later. So I will not give you the proof here. So if you know the um, parallel prefix sum algorithm from um, parallel algorithms, this is some kind of weighted version of, of this. So this is not, not very difficult. Okay. So now let's put everything together and try to bound um, the length of a derivation path. So maybe the, the starting variable is, is A1. It lies on some centroid path. And then we do the decomposition into the red part and the blue part. So let's suppose we continue in the red part and we leave the centroid path into some variable A2. So instead of taking this long path, we will take a shortcut via the suffix SLP from before. Okay, And this length is one plus log A1 minus log A2. And then we continue again. So A2 again lies on some centroid path and um, yeah, we exit it in some A3. And again, we get, take the shortcut, which has length one plus log A2 minus log A3. And then you can already see if you continue like this, you have this telescoping sum here, right? So all these terms here, they cancel out. So what only remains is uh, log A1, and this is bounded by log N and a bunch of ones. What, so what is the number of these ones? Well, it's the number of centric paths, and this is also log n. Okay, so this, this proves our, our bound, and so also our, our balancing theorem. Okay. So um, in the remaining minutes, I want to um, discuss a few extensions of this. In particular, I want to discuss different notions of balanced SLPs, because logarithmic height is just one, um, one type of balanced SLPs, okay? So in particular, the literature in the literature, they are also um, weight balanced and height balanced SLPs, which are strictly stronger than logarithmic height. So weight balanced SLPs, they were used in this paper by um, Charikar and co-authors. So what they want is that um, for every rule A to B, C, uh, the ratio of, of the lengths of B and C are bound by a constant from above and below. So basically, if you look in the derivation tree, then all the sizes of any two adjacent subtrees are just Basically, they are of the same size up to constant factors, okay? And then you also have height balanced um, SLPs or also called AVL grammars. So, I mean, the name already says it. So for every rule A to B, C, the height of uh, the derivation tree below B and the height of the derivation tree below C, they differ at most by, by one, okay? So the, the derivation tree should be an AVL tree. And for both of these, um, I mean, both of these notions, of course, have logarithmic height, and um, so in the Charika paper and in the Richard paper, they showed that 
you can always convert an SLP into a weight balance or height balanced SLP if you pay with the multiplicative cost of log n. So the, the size increases. And so these um, balanced, these strongly balanced SLPs are um, very interesting because they have a couple of applications. So for example, let me mention this um, grammar-based self-index by um, Travis Gagey and co-authors. So what they show is if you assume such um, balanced SLPs, then you can design a data structure which not only allows you to access symbols in your string, but also search for patterns. Um, um, so list all occurrences of a pattern in, in an efficient way. Okay, so I, let me also mention this one here, um, which is from the first talk, right? So I think they, they use also the um, these height balance, the, these AVL grammars um, as a pre-processing step for the Hemming distance problem. So with these applications in mind, it's, it's a natural question to ask whether we can somehow avoid this logarithmic blow up. Okay, so can you always convert an SLP with a, with a smaller blow up to weight balance or height balance SLPs? And unfortunately, the answer is no. And this even holds for a larger class of SLPs um, that can be called path balanced SLPs. Okay, so they are between logarithmic height, weight balanced, and height balanced. So what is the property? So if you look in the derivation tree, then every subtree T um, has the property that every root to leaf path uh, has length theta of log T. Okay, so basically, if you if you have some node and you look at two paths to some leaves, then basically they have the same length up to constant factors. Okay, and if you think about it for a while, both weight balanced and height balanced SLPs have have this path balanced this property, and um, yeah, there's this logarithmic blow up that I could show. So there are a class of SLPs that if you want to convert them into path balanced ones, then you need to pay with um, a logarithmic blow up. Okay, so this is bad news. On the other side, we also have, have good news. So we can actually achieve something weaker. And this is sometimes called locally balanced. Okay, so this is a very, very natural notion. So instead of just saying that the entire grammar should have logarithmic height, you can say that every subtree should have logarithmic height. Okay, so logarithmic in in the size of its um, uh, of its tree, of course. Okay, and in a, a paper from last year, I was able to show that you can always convert any SLP into such a locally balanced SLP where the size only increases by a constant factor. Okay, and this is interesting because again, this has some algorithmic applications. So let me, for example, mention this, this finger search problem, which was already studied before by Philip Biller and co-authors. So roughly speaking, the problem is the following. So you have some compressed string, and then you have some finger which points to some position in your, um, in your string. And you can also possibly move this finger around. And then the idea is that you want to access positions which are in close proximity of this finger uh, quickly. So ideally, if the distance is D, then you want to access in time log D. Okay, and using locally balanced SLPs, um, I was then able to, um, to give improved bounds for, for this problem. Um, so actually, I was able to show something a bit stronger, which is um, what I called contracting SLPs. So they lie between locally balanced and weight balanced SLPs. So here the property um, is the following. So here we actually need um, non-Chomsky normal form uh, grammars. So the, the right-hand size can be longer than two. So every rule of the form A to B1 to BK satisfies that the length of the BI variables is at most half of um, the length of A. So basically every time you, you move down in the derivation tree, your length reduces by, by a constant factor. I mean, you can replace this half by, by any factor, right? So in that sense, it's it's contracting in, in every step. And actually, you can convert any SLP um, with a constant factor blow up into a contracting one. Okay. Right. So let me conclude this talk. So the take home message is that balancing is some kind of generic pre processing step that then enables fast queries on, on your compressed data. Um, and well, there are a couple of open questions. Let me maybe mention this probably a difficult one. So it's an, I think a long standing open problem whether you can do random access also on LZ77 in linear space and uh, logarithmic time. So of course it would be interesting if one maybe could apply some kind of balancing techniques for this or maybe disprove that is, this is possible. Um, so one could look at LZ77 or even at um, collage systems. So they are like grammars, but you also have um, some kind of truncation operator where you can 
truncate some substring of um, of other variables. Uh, yeah, I would be happy to discuss these questions with you. Okay, thank you.